Number 27, this is an exponential function, right? Um, what is an exponential function? Just another quick review. Uh, y equals um, a times the base to the power of x minus h, but that's more algebra 2. You don't, we don't even see a minus h uh, in algebra 1, and then a big plus k out here at the end. Okay, That's an exponential growth or decay function. Just a little mini lesson right here on this question. The base, if it's greater than 1, from left to right, it's going to grow. If the base is less than 1, from left to right, it's going to decay to a certain value. Okay, We need to understand that. That's very important because you're going to have four multiple choice graphs. And just by looking at the base, you're going to know that from left to right, if it's greater than 1, from left to right, if it's greater than 1, it's going to grow. If the base is less than 1, it's going to start up somewhere up here, and it's going to decay from left to right. Okay, so let's understand that. That will help you find the answer, all right? Not only that, the k value is your up or down shift, all right? Your k value is your up or down shift. And this kind of is related to uh, parabolas that are in vertex form. You guys remember the vertex is hk? Well, the h is the movement on your x, and the k is the movement on your y. Same thing here. The k is the movement on your y. Now, obviously, right here, we don't even have a k. It's just a parent graph. And, and normally, when we do have an h and a k, I say ignore the h and k, graph your parent graph, and then do a shift according to h and k. I think we did that on the other exponential growth function a couple of problems ago. But anyway, right here, we don't even have an H and K, so we could jump right in to an input-output table. It's nice and easy. And on exponential growth or decay functions, it's very important that we use consecutive integer inputs, right? Nice zero, one, two, three, backwards, negative one, negative two, negative three. It's very important that it's in order. That way, you could plug in zero, and that'll give you a one, because anything to the zero power is one. So when you plug in 0, you get out of 1. Now if you plug in a 1 right there, 1 third to the 1 is 1 third. And if you plug in a 2 right there, that's really going to be a 1 third times 1 third, which is a 1 ninth. And if you plug in a 3, could so on and so on, right? Um, you already know that as, as we're going from 0, 1, 2, 3 on the x, as we go this way on the x, what's happening to these y values? Is it getting bigger or is it getting smaller? smaller? It's getting smaller, right? As you go this way, as you go 0, 1, 2, 3 on the x's, the y values are getting smaller and smaller by the factor of 1 third. Well, of course, if the base is less than 1, it's going to be shrinking. It's going to be decaying. So this next one would be 1 over 27. 1 third times 1 third times 1 third is 1 over 27. Now let's go backwards. If this way it's decaying, then this way it's going to be growing, right? Um, you could plug in the negative 1, which would cause this fraction to flip over, and it would become 3 over 1, which would give you just 3. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay. Or you could also think of it this way. From this easy output, that we plugged in a 0, we got out of 1, that was easy. From 1 to the next one, what happened? Well, you took the 1 and you multiplied it by 1 third. That's how you got 1 third. Then how do you get from here to here? Well, you multiply by one third. That's how you got one ninth. How do you get from here to here? You multiply by one third. That's how you got one twenty seventh, right? Backwards would be dividing by one third, which is really multiplying by three. So if you take one over twenty seven and multiply it by three, that'll become three over twenty seven, which reduces down to one ninth. When you multiply one ninth times three, it becomes three over nine, which reduces down to one third. <laughs> when you multiply this by three, the threes cancel. It becomes one. When you multiply by three, it becomes three. When you multiply by three, it becomes what? Nine. Whoops, sorry about that. 9, and then the next one would be uh, 27. Yeah, but that's way off the graph anyway. All right, so let's graph this uh, parent graph. So 0, 1 is right here. 0 on the x, 1 on the y. And if we go to negative 1 and positive 3, negative 1 on the x, positive 1, 2, 3 on the y, it's right here. And negative 2, 9 is right 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. I'm off the graph at negative 2, 9. Now, if we go this way, 1 on the x, 1 third on the y, check this out, 1 on the x, 1 third of the way up, it's not even halfway up. So I need to put a dot that's not even halfway up, it's about right here. 
And then the next one, two one ninth. Man, one ninth is hardly anything. And then the next one, one twenty seventh. You won't even, you can't even tell the difference there. But we know that it's going to infinitely get smaller and smaller and smaller. You could actually uh, draw your dots on the x-axis, but you need to know that it never actually touches. It just infinitely approaches the y value of zero. So if you had a plus five right here. If you had a plus five as a K value at the very end, a plus five, you'd have to get every single coordinate and move it up five units, right? If you had a minus two, you'd have to get every single coordinate and move it down two units. You guys understand that? Okay, so the K value is either up or down shift and there is no H value. That's in algebra two. All right, so right here, there is no H or K, so that's it, we're done. That's our graph. All we need to do is connect the dots And with the, with, the, uh, with the multiple choice, you're going to see some that from left to right go up. You could eliminate those because this is a one-third, which means it's going to decrease. Some of them might get shifted up or down. We know that there is no K shift, so this one has to be infinitely approaching X. Let's state a couple other things. Uh, the domain value, X equals all real numbers. Why is that? Because it does go to the left forever and it does go to the right forever. Even though it goes up this way, it never goes straight up. It keeps going to the left. So it really is x equals all real numbers. Okay, now for the range, the range are your y values, and this whole red graph is where? Is it above a certain value or below a certain value? Above. What, what value is it? Y, what y value is it above? Is it above the y value of 5? Is it above the y value of 2? Is it above the y value of 1? Is it above the y value of 0? Yeah, it's above the y value of zero, okay? So you're going to say y is greater than because it's above the y value of zero. Now, notice that I didn't put greater than or equal to because if you put the equal to, that means that it actually touches the zero. And we know it doesn't happen. It just infinitely approaches, never touches. Uh, what else could we say? Uh, we got the domain, the range. I could ask you for the y-intercept, I guess. The y-intercept simple that crosses at one. There is no axis of symmetry here. I guess that's about it. Oh, they actually ask us to fill this in, guys. The y-intercept is 1. The domain is x equals all real numbers. The range is y is greater than or equal to 0. So I put that information here. You should have it down here. Moving on to number 28. We spent a lot of time on 27. I apologize. What are the x-intercepts of the function? Well, how do we find the x-intercept algebraically? Like, if we had the graph of this parabola, you could just look at it and see where it crosses the x-axis. But we don't have the graph. So how do we find the x-intercepts algebraically? To find the y-intercept, you set x equal to 0. To find the x-intercepts, you set y equal to 0. That's what we need to know, guys. To find the x-intercepts, x int, set y equal to 0, and solve. Now, where's the y at? I don't see a y. Anybody? I don't see a y. I'm supposed to set y equal to 0. I don't see a y. What's going on? The f of x is the same thing as y. Okay? The f of x is the same thing as y. It's just, f of x is just function notation, but we're used to seeing y equals instead of f of x equals. It's the same thing. So, let's set this guy equal to 0. Now let's rewrite our equation and let's actually put the equal zero on this side because we're used to having the equal zero on the other side. So let's not put it on this side. And let's find those x-intercepts. I set it equal to zero, I now need to solve. So at this point, I have a quadratic trinomial equation that's set equal to zero. And I could either use the quadratic formula or try to factor, split, and solve. What do you guys think? What do you prefer? Let's go with the quadratic formula, all right? Now, another tip, when you look at your answers, look at your answers, and if you see that your answers look like quadratic formula answers, now what do I mean by that? Like if you have a fraction that says uh, a number plus or minus the square root of a number divided by a number, then you know you're going to use a quadratic formula. Now, if all of your answers, A, B, C, and D on your multiple choice test are nice answers like 2 and 3 or like 1 half and 4, then you know it's factorable. Then go ahead and try to factor, split, and solve. Let's go with the quadratic formula. So there's our quadratic formula, and of course, the best way to use this quadratic formula 
I say you have to do this, is replace those letters with parentheses. B, negative B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4 times A times C, all divided by 2 times A. That's the best way to do it. Identify your A value of 3, your B value of negative 5, and your C value of negative 7, and simply plug them in. All right, so here we go, plugging in. The negative 5 is the B, put them in both of those positions. The A value is 3, put it right there and right there. The C, the C value is negative. negative 7. Now, it's very important that we include those negative signs. If you forget the negative in front of the 7, the whole thing's going to be wrong. So please don't mess up on that. That's why I recommend using parentheses. Now, let's work on the discriminant value. Now, you could type all of this into the calculator, all right? And, and check this out, even better. If you have the Casio calculator, you could even type in the square root included, guys, all right? On the Casio, type in the square root, and then open parentheses, negative five, close parentheses, squared, minus four, parentheses, parentheses, three, and you just type it in exactly what it is, and it will not only give you an answer, if it's a radical, it'll give you the simplified radical answer. So as you can see, I typed it in exactly the way it is. I hit the equal button, and it gives me the actual simplified radical. So the whole thing could be done with the Casio, I don't think that is the case with the Texas Instrument. So you guys should be fighting for those Casios when it comes times to the, to the final. All right, so the inside, the, the, the square root ends up being the square root of 109. So let me rewrite everything. I have a positive five plus or minus the square root of 109 divided by two times three, which is six. And because this was not able to get simplified, you can't reduce it, you're done. It's over. That's your final answer. That's good we didn't try factoring the original equation because it's not factorable. You had to use a quadratic formula. Anyway, moving on, number 29, find the product. That one's pretty easy. It's all about distribution. Negative 3 r to the fourth times 4 r to the second. It's kind of like multiplying the coefficients first and then the, the variables next. So negative 3 times 4, that's negative 12 r to the fourth times r to the second, you add the exponents right there, so you get r to the sixth. Then we have negative uh, three r to the fourth times negative seven r. Negative three times negative seven is positive 21. r to the fourth times r is r to the fifth. Last but not least, negative three r to the fourth times negative two, just multiply the coefficient with the number. That's gonna be a positive six, and of course you still have that r to the fourth. And that's it, guys. That's like a free point on the final. Please don't miss that. Number 30, another easy question to do because all you're doing is distributing one term at a time. So it, don't get confused with the two terms. Just distribute the r first, right? r times r, r squared. r times negative 6, negative 6r. And as you can see, I already moved the box over to cover the r. Now I'm going to distribute the 7. Uh, 7 times r is positive 7r. Seven, 7 times negative 6 is negative 42. Let's combine those middle terms. You end up with a positive 1r. Positive 1r or just r. You don't need a 1. Bring down the r squared. Bring down the minus 42. And we are done. We have distributed. Let's move on to number 31. This one's very easy as well. These are like easy points right here. Uh, the power of 3 get, needs to get distributed to each item on the inside, each power on the inside. That's only because there's no addition or subtraction. All right? Like, just to review, if you add x plus 2 to the second power, you can't distribute that power in here. You cannot do it. You'd have to write the binomial twice. Okay? So it's only because there is no addition or subtraction between the terms that we're able to distribute. So let's distribute that 3 to the power of 1 that's on the 4. That'll give you a 4 to the 3rd. 3 to the power of the 5 right there. So you're going to multiply those powers. The power to a power you multiply. So you get g to the 15. And then 6 times 3 is 18. So right there, when you have a power to a power, you really do multiply those powers. If you look for that answer on the multiple choice, it won't be there because you still need to do this. 4 to the 3rd is really 4 times 4, which is 16, times 4, which is 64. 64, g to the 15, h to the 18 is your final answer for number 31. Moving on to number 32. 
Another easy one. Man, there's a lot of easy questions on this final. Um, they want you to find the product. They want you to multiply. So the only way to do that, again, I mentioned you cannot distribute when there's a plus sign. Can't do it. You have to write it twice. So let's do exactly that. 7C plus 9 times itself, 7C plus 9. So you're going to distribute one item at a time. 7C times 7C, 49C squared. 7C times 9, that's positive 63C. And then 9 times 7C is another 63C. And then 9 times 9 is 81 at the very end. The only other thing you could do is combine the middle terms 63C and 63C. Uh, that gives us a total of 126 of those C's, right? 60 and 60 is 120, 3 and 3 is 6. So that middle term is going to be 126 of those C values. Now, don't forget the first term, the 49C squared out in the front, and also the last term, the plus 81 at the end. There's your final answer for number 32. Let's go for the last easy one, and then we'll call it quits for this video. Number 33, it says find the sum. We are adding binomials, or not binomials, polynomials. Now, I'll tell you this, guys. On this one, I, I, I got this one wrong on the actual test because it's so easy that I rushed through it, and I didn't bother paying attention to the little details on the answers, right? You always want to start with your highest exponent term. Um, if there's a plus sign between your parentheses, you don't even need the parentheses. Just start combining like terms. So let's look at the highest exponent term, and you want to go with alphabetical order. So start with the a's in the highest exponent term. That's 13a squared. There's nothing else to combine it with, so that's the first part of our answer, 13a squared. And then you move on to uh, the next, well, there's also b squares, so we might as well put that one next, and there's nothing else to combine it with. So we're going to put the minus 2b squared right next to it. Now, after that, you want to move down to the a's. How many a's do we have? Well, we have a 7a right here and a minus 3a right there. We might as well do that in our heads. What's 7a take away 3a? 4a. So you're going to have a positive 4a. And then, do we have any b's? Yes, we have one b. It's right here. It's just a regular b. There's no other b's to combine it with. So we're just going to put that down plus b. And then, is there any numbers all by itself? Yeah, the number negative 9, minus 9, it's right there. Let's bring that down at the very end. So check this out, guys. We have a long, disgusting polynomial answer. I got the right answer on paper, but when I started looking for it on the multiple choice, they give one that looks exactly like it, but instead of a minus, there was a plus, and I picked that one because I thought, oh, everything's the same, and I picked it. And then later on, I found out I picked the wrong one because I didn't pay attention to the to the details. So, so please be very careful when you're identifying which is your correct answer. All right, uh, we just did questions 27 through 33. We'll do one more video, uh, separate video, covering the rest of these 34 through 40.